this is a very sad day for me and for the Bogleheads. At this point in the conference, I'd normally be introducing Jack Bogle, who would then proceed to impart, import uh, his words of wisdom on those of us in attendance. Today represents the first time in our event's 18-year history that we know in advance that Jack won't be joining us. However, I think that Jack is looking down on us and saying, keep the conference going. I'm with you in spirit. Years ago in Las Vegas, Jack asked me if he could have an informal, non-scripted chat with Bill Bernstein. And we all know that what Jack wants, he gets. So that was the start of what I dubbed the Far Side Chat with Jack and Bill. And it's continued as part of the conference agenda ever since then. Today, we're going to have a very special guest sit in for Jack and continue the Far Side Chat. Bill McNabb is the former CEO and chairman of Vanguard, leading the firm for a decade until he stepped down as chairman at the end of last year. He assumed the role of CEO in 20, 2008, just two weeks before the collapse of Lehman Brothers, which marked the beginning of the global financial crisis. Bill's consistent focus on doing the right thing for clients helped Vanguard, its crew, and its clients navigate one of the most economically tumultuous periods in the nation's history. During his tenure as CEO, Vanguard grew to serve more than 20 million investors around the world, and assets quadrupled from $1 trillion in 2008 to more than $5 trillion at the end of 2018. He always attributed this uh, success to putting clients' interests first and working hard to earn and maintain investors' trust. Today, Bill serves as chairman on the board of the Philadelphia Zoo and is a member of the board of directors of United Health Group and IBM. He's an active alumnus of Dartmouth College and the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and was awarded an honorary doctorate from St. Joseph University. He continues to be an active member in the investment managed industry, champ, uh, championing, championing good governance practices among public companies Please welcome Bill McDab. And Bill McNabb's companion for this fireside chat is a retired neurologist who helped co-found Efficient Frontier Advisors. He's written a number of best-selling titles on both finance and economic history. He holds both a PhD in chemistry and an MD. Please welcome one of the brightest guys I know, Dr. Bill Bernstein. And have at it, guys. Everything is fair game except politics. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Oh, um, yeah. Well, you know, we, we got three, four hours every year of the public Jack Bogle. Uh, and it was quite an education. It was, it was quite a personal and emotional experience. So we saw a lot of what I suspect was the public, Jack, even in front of this group. What I'd like you to speak to, Bill, is what you saw as the private Jack, not only him personally, but what I'm really more interested in is what he told you about the capital markets and retirement investing uh, and just investing in general for, for for small investors that he might not have said in public. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a couple of days here. Um, so first of all, th Mel, thank you, and uh, thank all of you for being here. It's, uh, this is a very emotional time, I think. Um, we held a, a service for Jack uh, in March on the campus, um, and the entire company was tuned in and uh, we actually were able to have all of Jack's successors, Jack Brennan, Tim Buckley, myself, as well as uh, Jack's son, John, uh, speak to the entire company. And so you think about it, four generations of leadership represented. I can't think of another company in America where that could happen. And, you know, again, you've got to give uh, Jack Bogle so much credit for sort of creating uh, that legacy. So again, I know he, he is looking down, he would greatly appreciate um, seeing all of you here. You know, Bill, I thought what I might do is I might start with just a couple of quick uh, Bogle stories because I think they actually get, will give you a sense of the man, what it was like to work for him. Um, 
And I, and I tell this because the day uh, we heard about Jack's passing, I happened to be on campus and I was walking, just walking around, you know, just crisscrossing uh, building to building. And I had so many different crew members come up and say something. Um, and people I knew, uh, you know, I've, I've worked at Vanguard for 33 years, so I know a lot of a lot of our crew. But there were also some folks I don't know and new people. And the, the most common question was, you, you know, what are your favorite memories? Uh, what are your favorite memories? And, you know, there was a lot, but uh, there were three um, that I sort of told uh, on a repeated basis. So I thought I'd start with that, and then we could delve into some of the more um deeper questions about the markets and so forth. So um, I had the privilege of, um, yeah, I came to Philadelphia in, uh, right after college to teach. I was teaching at a boys' school and coaching uh, three sports, um, sort of stumbled my way at, uh, to Penn and uh, sort of worked my way through Wharton, went up to New York for a couple of years and was, um, you know, frankly, pretty dissatisfied where I was working. I love the work, actually. Um, I was an analyst uh, working for what's now J.P. Morgan Chase, but I didn't like the culture. I didn't like um, a lot of the, I'll call it strategic direction. So I began to get itchy. My wife is from Philly. I had loved my time here. So we began thinking about coming back. Her family's all from here. And um, I got a call from a friend of mine uh, from business school who had gone into executive search. He goes, um, I've got sort of good news and bad news. And uh, I said, well, give me the good news. And he says, well, I've just been hired by this little uh, company you've probably never heard of, uh, Vanguard, to do a search, and I think you'd be perfect. I, I'm like, well, what could the bad news be? And he says, it's not exactly the kind of role you would envision yourself doing. And, and I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, you're, you're doing leverage buyouts and M&A transactions, all this fancy stuff on Wall Street. He goes... They're looking for a GIC product manager. <laughs> now I'm going to ask this audience. This audience is pretty adept. How many of you know what a GIC is? Yeah. All right. So almost a third. Guaranteed investment contract. It was uh, kind of like a certificate of deposit, if you will, issued by an insurance company to a qualified plan. So it was the most popular option along with company stock in the early 401k days. And we were just getting into 401k business. And... Um, we had just begun uh, work there, and so um, uh, Jack and others uh, within Vanguard decided we needed to sort of beef up our efforts there if we were going to be successful. I didn't, I didn't know what it was. You know, it's before the internet, so I'm running around going to libraries looking it up, um, <laughs> and trying, to, trying to find, trying to find out stories. Um, anyway. Um, I had to come down, and one thing that has not changed at Vanguard is we're very rigorous in our interview process. So I think I came three different times, um, probably went through 20-some-odd interviews. Now, remember, we were a few hundred people, and um, at that point, about $20 billion under management. And finally, the last interview, they're like, we want you to you know, meet the founder. Um, and again, this, I'm, this is a pretty junior-level role um, within the company, but... Um, so I was I was surprised, but if you made more than I think fifteen or twenty thousand dollars in those days, Jack had to interview you and had to sign off. Um, you know, again, the the attention to detail was pretty great. So anyway, I I I, I come in to do the interview, and um, Jack kind of he picks up my resume and he looks at it and he goes, you know, I bet you're an ambitious young fella. <laughs> I don't know why you'd come here. And I was literally, and I'm, well, Mr. Bubble, you asked me to interview. <laughs> and then for the next hour and a half, Jack proceeded to tell me why I should be there. Um, and, you know, he, he held court. He was lying, lying on his couch. He had just come back from a, um, a, a heart incident, as he called it. And he, the doctors were making him put his feet up. And so um, we went through this about an hour and a half. Um, I think I got two words in edgewise. So, um, I go home, and, and my wife says, well, how'd it go? Because she was really, by this time, she was ready to come back to Philly. And uh, I said, I have no idea. I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, if I'm offered the job, I'm going. Um, I said, it was compelling. Because you could feel the passion. You could feel the energy. You could feel um, there was something different. Uh, uh, you know, there was something obviously different about Jack. You all know that. But there was something different about the mission of the company, and it really appealed to me. So um, I accepted the, I was fortunate, I, I, I got the job, I really wasn't qualified for it, but um, I'm, I'm forever grateful that somebody took a bet. And then um, 
I was here only about a week and I got a call from Jack saying, hey, let's have lunch. And so we go and we have lunch. And this is really the second part of the story. And um, we go to our galley. As you know, everything's nautical. Um, even in, the, in those early days, we had two buildings back then. And uh, we're going through the line and Jack is negotiating with the chef over an order of french fries. And um, the chef is saying, Mr. Bogle, you can't have french fries. They're not good for your heart. And he's like, oh, how about a half an order? And they're going back and forth. And, um, you know, again, I had just left J.P. Morgan Chase. You know, I, I'd been privileged, quote unquote, to have lunch with the vice chair of the bank who would push a button under the table and like six waiters would come running in. <laughs> so I, I'm watching this going, like my, I think my eyes are popping out of my head. And he turns to me and he goes, what are you staring at? <laughs> I said, I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> and he says, well, he goes, let me, let me make a point really clear. He goes, everybody's job here matters. And it doesn't matter whether you're a chef in the cafeteria or you're an executive or your portfolio manager, everybody matters. And he goes, the only thing that is going to really get me upset is if I see a big shot kicking a little shot, I'm going to kick the big shot out of the company. And it was one of those object lessons, right? You know, you're a young, you're tw I was 29 years old, you know, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And you, you, you know, you, you get this sort of wisdom imparted to you. And I never forgot that conversation. And then um, the third story, and then we'll, we will get serious, but I, I, again, I, I just want to give you the flavor for what it was like to work with Jack. So um, many of you know he was a very avid squash player, and despite all the heart issues, he would find a doctor who would sign off and let him play squash. You know, he would just sort of rotate. <laughs> from, I'm looking at his daughters, and they're like, yeah, yeah, they, they knew the story. So um, uh, 1994, late 94, um, I, I was uh, privileged to be asked to join the executive team. Uh, Jack was still CEO, and so I was going to join the what we call senior staff and and, and run the 401k business and the uh, the other institutional businesses. And um, Jack's health had begun to turn, but he was still feisty as ever. And he's like, um, "Let's go play squash." Now I'm not much of a squash player, just to be very clear. But you know, I had 30 years. Um, on Jack, and um, I was an ex-rower, so I had a, a fair amount of fitness, so I could run around the court. So um, we go, and he goes, hey, he goes, I hate to do this, but um, I don't think he hated to do it at all. He goes, he taught me to work the defibrillator. And he, 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 so you want to talk about intimidation, right? You know, so you, you, you got the founder and, you know, the lifeblood of the company, and he's teaching you to work the defibrillator. He goes, I don't think we'll need it, but just in case. Um, so forget my strategy of just running around. I'm like, one shot and I'm done. Like, go for the, go for the winner all the time. So um, we played in the first two games, Jack won. Um, next two games, I won. And then he sort of slumped. And I'm going, oh, my God, here it comes. And um, he said, you know, I don't think I, he goes, you know me, I never quit. But he goes, I just don't think I can finish. I'm like, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to get out of here. He's going to be alive. I don't have to work the defibrillator. <laughs> so, so we left. And, um, you know, and then Jack's health deteriorated um, further, and he was in and out of the company a lot. Um, and, you know, he ended up going to the hospital and, and waiting for the transplant. So about um, nine months after the transplant, I get a call. And it's not, hey, Bill, how you doing? It's not, it's, we have unfinished business. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Jack. And his son, John, had given him a new squash racket. And so we had to go play squash. I had not looked at a squash racket since then. Jack had been playing nonstop. But it was, and trust me, this was one of those, you've heard of bosses golf. There was bosses squash. There, were, there was no way I was going to win this match. So, uh, but we, but you know, it was just classic Jack. And, um, you, you know, you mentioned that he would always, you know, encourage people to keep going. Um, you know, his phrase was press on regardless, as you know. And it was a great, great, lesson about press on regardless and you know again these are things that are imprinted on you and you know as you're joining the executive team to see that kind of fire and that kind of passion um, was really important so those are you know a couple of um, fun stories if you will that give you a sense of what it was like to work for him you know in terms of the business stuff um, I, I think the most important lesson he imparted 
and it's interesting. Um, I'm not sure he would say this, so I say it with you know all respect. He had this phrase that he loved to use in a lot of his speeches around creative destruction. And um, Joseph Schumpeter, the great Austrian economist, um, had, had really um, you know written extensively about this, and Jack just loved it. And I think Jack looked at himself as the creative destroyer, um, and you know somebody who would upend the markets, upend the way business was done. And so he took Schumpeter's words very, very um, much to heart. And um, we we talked a lot about that in my early days as CEO. And you know what, what was interesting is um, it gave you confidence as a leader. It also provoked you to think about your, how do you actually disrupt yourself? And if you think about Vanguard, and many of you have lived through multiple generations of the organization, we have changed quite a bit um, with the times, you know, from a little startup where, you know, the virtual relationship was through the post office box and a huge technological revolution was the 800 phone number to, you know, the creation of Vanguard.com to now all the virtual advice and, you know, things you can do in that space. And, you know, it was um, Jack's philosophy about creative destruction, which was way ahead of all the other writers who talked about disruption. And, you know, you know, whether it was Andy Grove, Only the Paranoid Survive, or, um, you know, some of the other, Clay Christensen, um, who, you know, has written extensively about this, Jack was really ahead of them and actually viewed his life's work, if you will, as being a disruptor. That wisdom, more than all the market stuff, believe it or not, was actually the most valuable lesson that he imparted, at least for me, because what it challenged us to do as a leadership team is to think about how would you beat Vanguard? How would you do a better job serving our clients than we can do? And then what do you have to do to respond to that as an organization? And we certainly don't always get it right, but that's what we've tried to do. That's been, you know, that's been at the heart of um, the heart and soul of, of, of who we are. And if you think about it, you know, Jack's initial revolutions, if you will, were all around our structure, and then around low cost, and then indexing being the you know purest expression of the low cost. But so many of the other things that we've done since are, are really built upon, upon the foundation of creative destruction and finding ways to disrupt yourselves before somebody else does it to you. So again, when I think back, um, uh, when I think back at all the different lessons Jack imparted, that probably was the single most important bill. Now, there are lots of things we could talk about in terms of capital markets and um, structure and whatnot, and I'm happy to go there. But it was that notion, um, at least for me, and, 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 you know, again, some of it may have been timing, coming into my role in the middle, you know, at the beginning of the crisis, um, that actually was very liberating. Um, and, and, and Jack and I did have a lot of conversations in those early days, and uh, it, it was very, very good, you know, sort of, I'll call it uh, a lesson imparted. Well, that that brings a brings up a second question then, which is, you know, we all know about his 1951 senior thesis at Princeton, which you know the heart of which was was the disruption of of the industry. So obviously, you know, the desire to do that and that drive uh, arose, you know, when he was a very young man. And do you have any sense of of where that came from? Yeah. Um I, I think so. So, um, you know, his, um, I think as you know, you, you know, most of you have heard Jack's family story and, you know, he ended up, um, his family had been very, um, successful and, um, fairly well to do. And then, uh, during the, the great depression lost everything essentially and had to start over. And Jack actually was a scholarship student at Blair Academy. Um, again, I had the privilege of being at Blair a couple months ago, um, doing a, a memorial for Jack, and uh, it was extraordinary um, to see um, his impact on Blair Academy. I actually think some of it 
started there, Bill. Um, you know, he had the wait tables. He was, you know, he was very aware he was on scholarship. And, you know, there were a lot of other very well-to-do students there. And I think that created uh, a restlessness in him that um, made him question things a little bit more deeply than um, others might have might have done at, at the same age or with the same sets of experiences. And it was that restlessness and questioning um, about how things could be better, I think, that was fundamental to who he was. You know, interestingly, um, when he came out of Princeton, uh, the two choices he had um, were to go to work for Philadelphia National Bank, which was kind of the thing you should have done, or go work for this little mutual fund company that he, you know, and he'd written about the, the industry. And I think he actually wrestled with that decision, um, but then you know decided to go with Walter Morgan, as, as you all know. And again, I think um, the you know what what was exposed in the in the 1951 thesis got reinforced by being with Mr. Morgan. Um, again, I had the privilege of uh, interacting uh, with Walter Morgan for a number of years um, before he passed away. Um, and because he would, he would come to board meetings and he would come to events and so forth. And he took great pride, obviously, in what Jack had accomplished. Um, again, he was kind of a revolutionary in his day in that the Wellington Fund was a balanced fund um, focused on high quality um, companies and high dividends and, you know, really high quality bonds during a period where it was leverage and really aggressive growth, if you will, uh, were the mantras of the day. So I, I think he found a kindred spirit, which sort of reinforced um, some of those notions. But I think a lot of it came from the way, you know, um, came from Blair and came from the restlessness that was created there. And, you know, this, I don't know how you, you, you teach this because I'm not sure it can be, I think it's just something that is sparked in an individual, but his creativity um, was um, one of his great strengths. And, you know, when you would be in meetings with him, the, the questions that would come from Jack were different than the questions that would come from 98 out of 100 other people. And I don't, I, you know, I don't know exactly where that comes from, except, you know, the background certainly had something to do with it and the restlessness, but he was never satisfied with just sort of conventional thinking. And I think that lack of satisfaction and that embracing of, I'll call it disruptive ways of doing things, um, started at a young age and uh, became just part of his mantra as, as time went on. Yeah, um, Mel, Mel Turner last night uh, reminded me of, of one of my favorite passages from Fred Schwed's Where the Customer's Yachts, uh, which was, you know, when brokers uh, were explaining to the younger brokers how the business worked, they explained that they would throw all the money at the ceiling, and what stuck to the ceiling was the clients. Um, and so it was obvious... It was obvious that that was the world back then that, that Jack wanted to disrupt. Uh, what, what, what made Jack unhappy about the capital markets in the last decade or two? What, 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 net, what, was, what did he see now that he wanted to disrupt? Yeah, so, um, and this is where Jack and I sometimes had, I will say, um, um, spirited discussions. Um, <laughs> You know, Jack worried about ETFs um, initially. Um, he thought that they were a trading vehicle. Um, I think as many of you have read, um, and Jack didn't speak about it a lot, but he, he did talk about it, especially later in life. You know, we'd actually had the opportunity to launch the first ETF, you know, what became the Spider. Um, you know, State Street did. Um, and then the, you know, the quadruple Q or whatever it is, um, you know, on NASDAQ. He, um, he passed on that because he felt they were just trading vehicles. And in the early days, th that's actually what they were. They were essentially a derivative substitute. And so he, he really was not very aligned with the whole um, creation of that. And, and you know, he, he continued to worry about it even um, as, you know, we got more into that business. And, you know, I, I think the point... You know, I tried to make to him, I know Gus Sauter, um, our CIO at the time, who, you know, invented our class structure for um, ETFs, you know, we, we made the point that you don't have to use these as a trading vehicle. 
You know, the, the beauty is they can actually serve that purpose, but they can also be a buy and hold strategy and be incredibly effective as well, especially for an advisor putting a, a portfolio together in a very low cost way for someone. And you may have seen Jack soften on that a little bit over time, and he would talk about that. He would talk about the difference. But, um, you know, Bill, I do think he really worried about the product pro proliferation there. He worried about some of the you know crazy structures that were coming out. Um, he worried about leverage um, in, in ETFs, implicit leverage in, in particular. So um, I think that was a, a fairly big concern. But you know, for me, what was interesting was it was actually the same set of concerns that Jack had always had about the mutual fund industry. It was a very parallel set of concerns because again, I sat through all the meetings during the late 80s and early 90s with him on product development stuff where he worried that there was a new fund coming out every hour, um, you know, different flavor of something. And he, he just thought it was all being done just for salesmanship as opposed for really good investment principles. And, um, you know, one of the things he charged us with um, as a result was any time we brought a new fund out, we really had to be asking the fundamental question about, um, is this a, a needed and useful solution for people? And, you know, it was a really good test for us. Um, but I think he, he, he continued right up to his last days to worry about the product proliferation, in particular on the ETF side. Um, you know, I think on the capital market side, um, the other concern he had, and one which I share pretty deeply, um, was the rise of algorithmic trading and um, what you know what's happening in that world. And he he spoke about that uh, several times. You know, it's a really really complex topic, as uh, some of you know, um, because in a sense, without some of this trading now, I'm not sure markets would actually work as well as they work. Um, and, and that has more to do with the structure of the U.S. markets than anything else. Um, but a lot of the knitting, if you will, that's there is, you know, these algorithmic traders pr pr actually provide an incredible amount of liquidity. You know, the problem is they don't necessarily provide the liquidity when you most need it um, because they're not regulated in that way. And I think there's, you know, Jack, Jack was always sort of pushing the SEC to think about that. I think the SEC actually is looking at that. And many of the rule changes that have occurred to sort of rein, rein some of that in, um, they may have had their origins in some of Jack's speeches and then certainly some of our policy advocacy to uh, tighten things up there. And I would say we're in a better place than we were as a result. Yeah, um, a, couple, a couple of thoughts about that. Um, you know, whenever I hear a hedge fund manager talk about benefits of hedge funds to society, that they in particular provide liquidity, whenever I hear the words we provide liquidity, I, I hold on to my wallet. <laughs> um, Vanguard, like all large corporations, you know, faces challenges from within and without. Uh, and I'd like you to address each of those. And I'll, I'll, I'll direct you to, to start with the, the easy one, which is what do you see as the external challenges to Vanguard? Then we'll get to the internal ones. Yeah, so, you know, on the external side, there's no shortage of challenges right now. I mean, there you know, many competitors who are actually trying to come at us um, on the price side, um, being very selective about how they do that. And, um, you know, the interesting thing is the market's actually been pretty um, pretty discerning about that. So when, you know, some people come out with, you know, really low-cost uh, funds or ETFs, they look at the other prices of the other product suite that gets sort of blended together. And, um, you know, again, a lot of analysts have actually... Um, call our competitors on that. It actually hasn't hurt us that much. But the, the fact is, low cost is no longer our domain alone. And I actually think this is a good thing. Um, and you know, the competitor in me hates it, but the societal person in me loves it because investors are better off. You know, at, at the end of the day, you know, Jack's dream of changing the industry is actually happening. People are actually paying attention to costs. So from a competitive standpoint, that's certainly an issue for us. Look, um, the, the second one is we're big and we're um, increasingly the largest shareholder in most companies. 
So that puts you under the microscope, um, both from a regulatory and government standpoint, as well as from a just outside pundit uh, uh, standpoint. And we certainly hear a lot about those issues. Um, you know, there have been a couple of papers written about, um, you know, Vanguard's too big and needs to be broken up because um, it's going to exert too much control on corporate America and so forth. And, you know, um, there's even a conspiracy theory out there that somehow Larry Fink and I were um, working together to raise airline prices um, because we both are the most significant owners in airlines and that would be, you know, a really good thing for us, which this is a great example of somebody mixing correlation and causation and uh, not really understanding the difference between the two. But I, I say it, you know, partly tongue-in-cheek, but seriously as well. I mean, we actually have to spend time on this stuff. You know, we, we have to spend a lot of time educating people. So I look at the, um, from the external standpoint, just the, the, the scrutiny that goes on um, because of the success of the firm. And you know, it's, a, it's a privilege to have that scrutiny in a sense, but it's also, you know, it, it takes a lot of time for our leadership team and time that you'd rather, frankly, devote to clients and, and just being focused on the business. Um, you know, internally, um, I think the biggest risk we have is our success, uh, and it is becoming complacent. And um, I know Tim Buckley shares this uh, with me. Um, again, you do not grow up in the house of Ogle with um, with, with a notion that complacency is a good thing. I just say that, you know, it, it was so imparted, uh, so frequently imparted to us that, you know, the minute complacency seeps in, you're dead. And, you know, one of the, one of the really interesting things, um, probably two months into Tim uh, taking over as CEO, he put a book on all of his leader's table, uh, leader's desk called uh, The Founder's Mentality. And it was sort of getting back to the urgency of a brand new company and having to, you know, earn your way each and every day. Um, you know, not again, no, no uh, disrespect to the past, but just saying, have we maintained our sense of urgency? So I had a couple people come running into my office and go, you know, their hair's on fire. Um, like, can you believe Tim's doing this? I'm like. I think the board actually made a great choice in the next generation because that's exactly what he should be doing. Um, and, and so, Bill, that's the thing that I think worries us. Um, I think we've got the right leadership team to combat it, but it's a never-ending battle. Um, you know, the more successful you are, um, in some ways, the less willing you are to take risk and in creating new ways of doing things and thinking outside the box, and which has again been our hallmark. Um, I grew up in Rochester, New York, so I watched this up close and personal. Um, Eastman Kodak, many of you um, probably know the story, Eastman Kodak actually invented digital photography. But Eastman Kodak did not, you know, this got to sort of the definition of what Eastman Kodak, did. Eastman Kodak considered itself a film company. And that, if, you, if you read their mission statement and so forth, that, that's what it was all about. And they missed this unbelievable revolution that was going on. If Eastman Kodak had considered itself its main mission in life to be the preserver of memories, they would have approached it completely differently. So one of the things we did, um, you know, as we were getting bigger and more successful, we actually restated our mission and you know we went back I actually I, I reread every one of Jack's speeches looked at a lot of Jack Brennan's writings on this and so forth and the team came up with you know our current purpose if you will which is to take a stand for all investors treat them fairly and give them the best chance for investment success and you might notice in there there's nothing about being the low cost provider of mutual funds or you know anything that's more, it, that's really limiting. That, and again, we're not going away from low-cost mutual funds, trust me. But the idea that our job is to give investors the best chance for success and to take a stand for them, it was so deeply embedded in the founding of this company, we felt it very important to make the statement. And, you know, Bill, for me, that's how you try to combat, you know, the, the thing I worry about. But, look, I'd be, 
I would be less than honest if I didn't tell you I go to you know go to bed every night worried that success goes to our head. And um, again, I have great faith in the leadership team that's in place, but that will be a, a never-ending battle for us. Yeah, there's something that I think about a lot, which is not just the differentiation between what the public sector does, what the government does, and what the private sector does, but there's a third sector which we don't think enough about, which is the nonprofit uh, sector. Almost all education uh, in this country is done in nonprofits, uh, and uh, you know the for-profit uh, uh, sector in education, for that matter, in prisons hasn't exactly covered itself uh, in, in glory. Uh, healthcare. You know, most of us are going to wind up in the hospitals uh, that are run by nonprofits. So the question I have for you uh, is: Is does Vanguard view itself as a nonprofit corporation? Um, short answer is no. Um, we actually view ourselves as a very profit-oriented um, organization, but we define it differently than others do. We don't define it in the traditional P&L. We actually define it in what's the net return to our investors. Um, at the end of the day, that's what matters. And so, you know, our maniacal focus on cost over the years is to make sure that more of what an investor earns in the marketplace stays with the investor. But that's actually how we measure profitability. Um, because if you think about it, being owned by the funds and therefore the clients of the funds, at the end of the day, they're like, if you, if you, if you do the analogy to a shareholder, creating earnings for your shareholders, which is what a public company does, is we're trying to create earnings for our shareholders, which are our fund holders. And we try to do that in the most efficient, cost-effective way. And frankly, when we look at success of the firm, you know, there, there were four metrics that we, we, we focused on. Um, three external, one internal. And the metrics were uh, externally, how are our funds performing versus our competitors? So how do we measure up? Because you all have a choice. You can be in a Vanguard fund or you can be in an ABC fund. And um, there's thousands of funds. We know there are more funds than there are securities now. So um, it's sort of an interesting factoid. And so we, we, have, we, we were maniacal about that. The second thing that we actually measure up, we you know, sometimes survey people to death and we hear that. Um, I apologize for it, but we want to know what our clients think. So we client loyalty. And we can measure this both mathematically as well as through survey data. The mathematical measure is the, the redemption ratio in a fund. So how long do people stay in a particular fund? And, and one of the things we're really proud of is our fund shareholders tend to stay with us three times as long as the average shareholder in the industry. Um, very loyal client base. And then you know we will use survey data to reinforce that message. The third metric was the expense ratio. Because we know the one thing we could control, we couldn't control the absolute return in the market, but we could control our expenses, and so we could have a real say on what the net return was. And so we were, you know, that goes back to you know, 1974, 1975 when we launched. And so those three metrics, fund performance, client loyalty, and expense ratio, were, were how we thought about the external side. And in a sense, fund performance and the expense ratio, if you sort of look at them together, that is in a sense a P&L for um, how you're doing for your investors. Um, the, by the way, you might be interested, the fourth metric was our employee engagement, our crew member engagement. So we wanted people to think this was a great place to work. And you know, despite what the Philadelphia Inquirer says occasionally, um, we actually are a great place to work. Our, our turnover is extraordinarily low and um, we have a great group of people who are just dedicated to the client. They love the mission. Um, they love being here. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many 25 and 30 year celebrations I've been to in the last few years. Um, people who, you know, been here since the beginning or near the beginning. Um, so that metric was actually really important to us as well because we thought without great people, none of the other stuff is going to happen. Okay, well, I'd like to shift gears now a little bit and talk about some more general macro issues. And the way I want to segue into that is talking about ESG investing. Uh, I know you're an enthusiast uh, about that. You think a lot about it. And I'm wondering if you think about those three different components uh, differently. People tend to 
people tend to put the lump them all together. I don't think they're the same thing, and I think that they have different sets of returns and considerations, and I'm wondering if you you address that. Yeah, so ESG has become you know quite the, the buzz word or buzz phrase, if you will, in the industry. Um, in Europe and in parts of the Pacific, it's um, actually required to be um, stricter on some of these issues. I, I, should, I should interrupt yes. just, we just, just yes. say for the audience. Yeah, E means environmentally conscious, S means socially conscious, and then G refers to corporate governance. Yep. I, I should have made that clear up front, I'm sorry. Yeah. So let me let me start with the G, um, because I think that's the easiest one to get your hands around governance. And um, this is the one we think we can affect the most, um, to, to be blunt, um, how well our companies govern. And this gets into board composition, um, how, uh, board, how boards compensate their management teams, how boards oversee strategy, risk, and so forth. And we think that um, there's a lot of influence that big investors can have here. And you know what's interesting is, um, just, just sort of a side note, uh, people always are like, well, you know, if you're an index shareholder, what do you care? Because you have to own the stocks. So why do you care about governance? And then we'll hear the follow-on is you don't care, and you know, because you guys don't don't pay a lot of attention to this. You know, before we wrote our first letter, um, Jack Brennan wrote a letter in 2005. I think Jack Bogle gave a speech on this in maybe 2001. So before that speech, before Jack Brennan wrote the letter, no active manager in, in, in the U.S. except you know the activists were actually talking about governance. Like it was not a topic, and so our view is it's a really important role for a shareholder um, because you know when we first started this journey, board members had frankly lost their way a little bit. Um, if you would ask a board, like I, I gave a speech on this 2008 or nine. I said, you know, boards should engage with their big shareholders. They should be willing to hear what the shareholder thinks about the company and so forth, um, about the board composition. And I almost got run out of the room. The, the board, board members said, why would we do that? And I'm like, who do you think you represent? And, the, and there was like this stunned silence and, oh yeah, yeah the shareholder, yeah, yeah, you guys elect us. Um, so, and, and I say that a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's a really important concept. So the G is something we think we can influence. Now, Bill, you I mean you've done more mathematical research on factors and all kinds of things. So you know probably know this better than I do. There is no evidence yet that quote unquote better governed companies perform better. This is one of the holy grails is to figure out if any of these factors actually drive return. And there's lots of debate in the industry about this, and you'll see different um, interpretations of data. Um, and you know, it's hard to actually define what is good governance. We have we, our notion is good govern governance is that at the highest level, the board is doing an effective job overseeing talent strategy and risk. And I say overseeing the processes, making sure management is doing the right things, not actually doing it. The board's job is to govern, not to manage. Um, and they're, they're putting the shareholder interests you know, right there at the top. Doesn't mean other stakeholders don't matter. Um, we can get to that in a minute because there's been a lot written about that, but the shareholder really has to be in the room. And you know, look, I think over time we will see that better governed companies as we define them and, and we find ways to sort of look at that mathematically a little bit more effectively I think we will see that it does lead to better performance generally, but it won't be no guarantee. Uh, it will be no guarantee. So we're spending a lot of time on that. When you get into the other two factors, uh, societal and environmental, you know, everybody's definition is very different. And as you know, many ESG products that are out there today are um, they're what, they, what I call exclusionary. They screen certain names out based on certain criteria. So, you know, you might have um, a carbon footprint fund, you know, so companies with high carbon footprint, you're not going to invest in, um, you're only going to invest in companies with low carbon um, footprint. Now, there, there's two theories on this that are out there. You know, there's the, um, the there's there's one that's, I, I would say, the real, the real story, which is some people just want that and they're willing to give up potential return for it. 
that's fine. Actually, I think that, that's something that's an individual's choice. And then there are people who will say, we know that these you know, funds will outperform in the long run. I don't think we know that. You know, again, all the math we've seen does not necessarily suggest that. So it doesn't mean that they, the, the fund has no reason to exist, but the promise that a factor like that is going to lead to outperformance, I think is misleading um, at best. And so we're actually spending quite a bit of time on, on the topic. I think the, um, from, a, from a product standpoint, if you will, creating indices and so forth, anything that you do there, you've got to be very clear with investors about the trade-offs that they potentially are making. Okay, so it, as long as you're clear on that, then I think it's fine to have these kinds of vehicles. Um, uh, but I think it's incredibly misleading to tell people that you think they're going to outperform. Um, you know, socially responsible investing was a big thing in the late 90s. And um, the way the screens worked is you had an overweight to tech. And so 1998, 1999, you, you were socially responsible and you were outperforming the broad market by 1,000 basis points. Year, so everybody thought you were a hero. Then the tech wreck happened, and guess what? Those products disappeared. Um, you know, people people were so disappointed; they, they didn't understand actually the factors um, that they were exposed to. So th that's the exclusionary side. So the more complex side is how do you engage with companies around these issues? And again, I'm going to bring you back to sort of our fundamental. Um, belief on governance, which is uh, boards, boards, you know, if you look historically and you were, you know, you were to do a survey 20 years ago and say, what's your primary job? They would say, pick the CEO, pick the right CEO and, and all good things will happen. I think it's much more complex today. I think boards have a really important role to play in the oversight of not just the CEO selection, which is still important, but talent overall in the company. So has the company got sufficient talent for the evolving marketplace? strategy, oversight, and risk. And you know, many of these environmental and societal um, social issues, if you will, fall in the risk category. So from a governance standpoint, we, wanna, we actually want to know how companies are thinking about these issues without necessarily saying one, you know, one interpretation of, and let's use climate change as an example, we're, we're we're less interested in somebody saying we believe the science or we don't believe the science. We're much more interested in a board saying, here's how we view it from a risk perspective in terms of how consumers view our business, how our supply chain works, all of those sorts of things. And here's how we're thinking about that. Because if there's greater clarity around how you interpret different types of risk, theoretically, there is have a more accurate stock price, if you will. Um, and that kind of transparency, we think, is really necessary. So that's where we've been spending quite a bit of our time uh, on the engagement side, is really trying to understand how companies view these factors from a risk perspective. And you know, can you learn something that actually makes the market, you know, the, the market pricing mechanisms work even more effectively? It's by no means an exact science at this point. And um, you know, one of the things I think we're going to see as time goes on is there's a lot of pressure for shareholders to you know act on some of these issues because government's not and so you know you've got a lot of stakeholders out there who are frustrated with the lack of action in certain categories of these um, topics and so they push really hard for other constituents to try to have an effect and I think it's a very, very difficult thing for a company, you know, a shareholder to do because again, everybody's interpretation is really different. I'll give you, I'll give you just one practical example. So, um, I have a, we have a great family friend. She's a very, very, very devout Quaker. Uh, those of you familiar with um, Quaker, Quaker beliefs, um, one, one of the fundamental beliefs is war, war cannot be tolerated. Just through in, in the military, therefore, anything military related is bad. And so she asked me, um, she young. Um, very idealistic. She's like, so what can I invest in? And um, she started running through companies. And, you know, she started with, like, some of the cool tech companies. And I'm like, you know, she starts with Google. And I'm like, I don't think you can do that if you're anti-military. I mean, who do you think is doing all the, the, you know, the satellite stuff that drones are based on? So she's horrified by that. Well, what about Apple? You know, 
and make really cool stuff. Well, you know, look at Apple's military business. So, you know, by the time we worked our way through, I think we were down to about five companies out of the S and P 500 that she could invest in. I mean, it was real. You know, and, and I tell the story because I actually really felt maybe she wanted to express her beliefs in the way she invested, and she was willing to sacrifice return. But the the, the problem was her. Her definition of socially responsible was so broad that literally, I mean, treasury bonds would be the last thing she could own. Um, so, you know, she couldn't invest. Um, so, you know, to me, th that's at, at the heart of all this discussion around ESG is everyone has a very different interpretation. You know, what, what is environmentally sound to you may be very different than that. And how we as a provider actually get our hands around that is actually pretty complicated. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to look at it um, from a somewhat, somewhat different angle. Um, and I tend to separate them out. When I look at G governance, I see that as a positive return factor. I think there's pretty good data. There are pretty good data in, in back of that. And, you know, if you look, for example, at companies uh, where the executives are spending all their time in private jets running around for personal purposes, they're spending $20 million for a house, you can actually isolate that as a negative return factor, a very, very big one. And that goes all the way back hundreds of years. You know, John Blunt with the South Sea Company, uh, you know, George Hudson with the English Railways, more recently, Adam, Adam Newfeld was a classic example, or is a classic example of that. These are bad actors, they're pretty easy to, to identify. So that's one, I think, negative selector. There's some more subtle things you can get out as well. S and G, I look at as negative, uh, strong negative return factors. For example, you look going back 80, 90 years, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, okay? You know, there should be a government agency that deals with those, right? Uh, all have, all beat the market by two to four percent over an 80 or a 90 year period. And the reason is very simple. People avoid those companies, the prices will fall, their expected returns will rise. And so the idea that you're going to affect social policy by disinvesting in those companies makes no sense at all. And maybe it's more likely that those companies will get into private and will escape public scrutiny. I've never understood it as, as, an, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a as a tool for advocacy. Um, you know. Uh, and then as far as governance goes, I'm looking at more general concerns from Rambo's point of view is in terms of societal, you know, just societal, the health of the society and the health of the capitalist uh, system where we've now evolved a compensation system that relies heavily on stock options, which really you know, incentivizes companies to, to, to manipulate their short-term earnings reports uh, and not to think of long-term they don't, they don't embrace you know, Warren Buffett's uh, theory of long-term need. Yeah, you know, so a couple of um, just ad sets. So I couldn't agree with you more on the, you know, your observations around the E and the S, at least historically. So um, no question that those, you know, the, the companies in the industries you listed have outperformed. Um, and again, this is part of why when we talk to people about doing some of these exclusionary screens, we really try to remind them that you are likely giving up return and just understand that as an investor. So 100% um, agreement there. You know, on the, uh, on the governance side, um, one of the really important things we think is um, the emergence of Vanguard and you know, other index providers is actually changing some of the, the dynamic. And it's actually, I think, positive change. I think it's still very early innings. Um, again, this is something uh, Jack Bobo and I spoke quite a bit about um, uh, during the last couple of years because it was um, this, this is a real this is a real sea change. And here here's here's the heart of the issue. So we talk. Everybody talks about long termism. So you know, you, you look at a lot of your traditional funds and traditional managers. Look at the portfolio of turnover. It belies the idea that they're long term. Most active funds, on, the, on average, active fund turnover is about 80%. Even if you factor, if you say, okay, let's just do name turnover, name turnover is over 50%. So that means the holding period is less than two years. 
So when somebody who says I'm really long-term oriented, they're not. Okay, and, and that's where a lot of the pressure has come from. So I, so Bill, I, I, I agree with your observation there on the short termism. Here's the difference: for our index holdings, we can't sell a stock when we don't like what's going on in the company. We are a permanent shareholder. And what's interesting is we're now having those discussions with companies, and it's a very different set of discussions than what they're used to. Because we can't just, if we don't like what we hear, we just can't go home and say, let's just get out of this and go pick another company in the sector and be happy. Um, so active engagement with boards and independent directors has become a big thing. So we'll probably do 1,100 uh, engagements this year, um, and that number is just going to keep growing. And most of it is around this notion of what's it mean to be a permanent shareholder, and what, how can you as an organization better align yourself with a permanent, you know, a, a permanent sense of capital. And it doesn't mean that short-term actors have no, you know, place in this universe, but they shouldn't have an outside voice. Should not have an outside voice. So somebody who owns, you know, one percent of a company and wants them to spin this division and you know merge this thing and do this and do this to jack up um, the stock price of, for the quarter, if that's detrimental to our long-term, you know, the long-term value of the company, we're actually going to stand against that um, from a, a, you know, from a governance standpoint. And you know, we're beginning to have a much. I, I would say there's a much more there's a much larger voice. Now, it's really, the challenge, of course, is, um, as you can well imagine, everybody wants to politicize that voice as quickly as they can um, and, and push, you know, social agenda um, and political issues as opposed to economic issues. And so the way we deal with that is when, when somebody, let's say uh, somebody on the yes, an activist, a, society, you know, a social activist comes to us with an idea, our first question is, show us the link to long-term value creation and we'll have a discussion. You know, so if you're writing a proposal to a board um, to be considered for the shareholders, we want to see the link to long-term value creation. If there's a link, we're going to listen. We're, you know, we may disagree, but we're at least going to listen. If there's no link, we're not going to really spend a lot of time on it. So that's kind of how we're trying to, to handle this bill. And, and again, it's very new territory. Um, you can imagine these are tricky issues to deal with. The, the, the fundamental underlying principle, though, is what's in the interest of our long-term investors because again as I started um, by saying um, we have investors who tend to stay with us for a very long period of time and therefore and, and then in our index funds in particular but also many of our active funds have very low turnover relative to their peers you know we are we are by definition a long-term shareholder if not a permanent shareholder and we need to reflect that and we need to reflect um, those values do you or can you even speak to how well you coordinate with BlackRock? So we don't coordinate with BlackRock. Um, it used to be one. Um, we can't. Um, there would be all kinds of antitrust issues. And frankly, I shouldn't say this, but I will, because you guys are friends. Um, <laughs> you know, what BlackRock says and what BlackRock does are sometimes very different. Um, we try to do what we actually say. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and, you know it's, and, and again, I. I pay a lot of attention to what they say because they actually say some important things and they're very influential. But I, I think how you, if you look at, for example, how we compensate active managers, so I've spent most of the time talking on index, I think all of you know, because um, we, get, we get notes from you all the time, um, <laughs> that all of our active managers are under incentive contracts where it's long -term, you know, longer term performance that's rewarded, not short term performance. And it's and by the way, it's it's perfectly symmetrical. If they underperform, they get paid less. If they outperform, they get paid more. And what that does is it incents them to think longer term. Um, most of them are on a three-year. I would like to see it go to five. Um, we have a couple I think who we managed to do that, but you know that's very different than anybody else in the industry. So people will talk about long-term, 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 and then you look at how they incent their portfolio managers, and you look at how they act, how you know how they actually act. It's quite different. So. Um, for me, um, so we, we, we don't coordinate with them. Um, we certainly pay attention to what they say. We pay attention to what State Street says. We pay attention to what Tia Kreft says. All of these organizations have intelligent, thoughtful, constructive things to say on this topic. So you've got to be a student of, of what they say. But 
you know, we're we're um, trying to carve our own way here. And you know, frankly, I again with all humility, the guy who runs this for us, Glenn Warren, is considered by most people in the, in the industry to be the best. So frankly, people pay a lot of attention to what Glenn says and um, what he does. And I think we're actually able to affect change a little bit uh, more greatly than even our, our direct influence because of Glenn's thoughtfulness here. Yeah. Uh, on a lighter note, um, did you did you see happen to see Michael Berry's interview with Bloomberg? Okay, just just as a Michael Berry was was the hero of the Big Short. Uh, this this uh, uh, autistic ex neurologist who uh, called the uh, financial crisis by. Was he, he loved reading uh, corporate bond offering statements, uh, and he he went on record as saying that uh, that uh, markets have grown terribly inefficient because of indexing, and he thought that there was you know an outsized play in undervalued uh, small value stocks and Japanese stocks and you know, these hundred dollar bills lying on the ground. He was going to be describing how he was going to be picking them up. I'm wondering how you responded to that. With a chuckle, um, <laughs> you know. Um, Look, he's, you know, I think he's becoming an active manager, so, he, he, you know, it, it's a story. So I would say two things. Um, one, you know, so let's, like, look at the practical part. Is indexing the bubble? I don't think so at all. Um, you know, the difference between the financial crisis that he, you know, didn't talk quite eloquently about um, in his own way was, um, you know, one of the most important elements of that was massive, massive, massive amounts of leverage. Right. So the leverage was a critical component there. Um, there is no leverage in, in investing, right, in what we do in the index side. We're, we're purely agents. So the fact that there's no leverage actually removes a lot of risk. And frankly, if you think about it, um, because we're not a proprietary investor, we're an agency, you know, you're the ones who bear all risk. Like funds go, you know, index goes up, you do well, index goes down, you don't do as well. Um, that's very different than what was going on during the financial crisis, where you know, proprietary positions were really what was driving so much of uh, what went on. So I, I think the analogy is, is, is very weak. Now, to his um, observations that value stocks may be actually really valuable today, um, I'm much more agnostic about. It. You know, I, I think there has been a massive premium. Uh, put on growth. You know, we are at the longest period in history of value under performance. And, you know, if you look at sort of value versus growth, you, you see these tremendous waves um, over time where one's, one outperforms usually for much longer than one expects. Um, but they usually cross. And this is the longest period where we've seen growth outperform. I would argue, and again, I, you know, I'd be really interested because you know, really you've written a lot about factors, and you've 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 thought about this um, probably more deeply than I have. But I think when you look at macroeconomic policy and its impact on the capital markets, um, it's actually really reinforced the importance of growth. And so I think growth stocks have been bid up as a result because you know we've lived in this very low growth economic time. So investors have put a huge premium on finding growth, you know, some level of growth. And what that's done is it's really driven the price of growth stocks um, you know, to a level, um, or the gap between growth stocks and value stocks to a level we've not seen. Um, usually, those sorts of things do eventually reverse themselves. So that's where, you know, I, again, I, I, I look at what Barry's saying on that front, and it's somewhat interesting. When and how that all happens, I don't know. You know, we are in unprecedented territory in terms of central bank intervention, and that shows no signs of abatement. And um, I think that's actually distorted the markets uh, to a large degree. Um, this is a personal opinion, not necessarily a Baker opinion, but I, I, I think the what's gone on both at the Fed and, and the central banks in terms of monetary policy is, is so unprecedented, we've not gotten back to normal. And, um, you know, there, there is a sense among the central banks that they can make economies more recession-proof than their predecessors could. I'm not even sure that's a good thing, by the way, because I think recessions are actually important. Go back to Schumpeter. But um, we're, we're, we're living in a period 
that we've never seen this kind of intervention, and it is definitely having distortion effects on the capital markets. Um, no question in my mind. Yeah, I mean, with regard to the future of value premium, as my late mother used to say, from your lips to God's ears, um, uh, you know, and I do see uh, the same thing that you're seeing in terms of the overvaluation of, of, of that of growth stocks, uh, simply as being a, f a function of low inflation uh, and low interest rates, which gets to my, my, what I think is going to be my, my last question, yeah, my last question, which is, uh, you, you know, do you see uh, the, the, the equity risk premium and the risk-free rate, the two components of returns, risk-free rate for, for fixed income and the sum of that and the equity risk premium as uh, historically shifted to lower values over the past 20 or 30 years. You know, until, until you know, 30 or 30 or 35 years ago, those existed within fairly narrow bounds, and we seem to have jumped uh, the shark uh, in terms of a lowering of both of those values, and I'm wondering if you think that's permanent or not. Um, I thought I'd end with the easy one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so look, the short answer is I don't know, um, because again, you know, the, the policy, the policy changes are so profound, um, it's hard to see it reversing anytime soon. Um, the, the, the low, the, the low risk-free rate feels to me like a, a, a even longer term thing that we're going to live with. I think the equity risk premium, that one I'm not sure about. You know, I, I think there's a possibility that we'll see um, a return to norms there, but I, I don't know when. It's certainly a, a long ways out. But you know, that question, Bill, does bring up, I think, a really, really important notion. And you know, again, you're, you're going to have people far, far smarter than I am talk about this. But I know if Jack were here, he'd want to remind people of his little formula for predicting future returns, which happens to correlate very closely with our own multi-variable capital markets model, which has got like quantum computing going on or whatever. Um, we look, we actually, on an absolute basis, are, are expecting lower equity returns over the next decade. Um, it, it, I, nothing is ever a sure thing, but it's close to a sure thing in my, in my view, just where valuations are today. And it's not going to be a straight line. And so the combination of lower equity returns and perhaps even normal volatility, that's not a good combination for investors. You know, normally when we see real volatility, at least people are like, well, you know, hopefully I'll get rewarded for that in the long run. Um, I'm not convinced of that right now. Again, Bill, I don't know what your own work um, suggests there, but we think, you know, even if you took the equity risk premium as sort of what, what it's been historically, and you look at where, where um, the risk-free rate is today, you put those together, you get a much lower return than what we've seen historically. If, if it stays a little bit compressed, as you suggest, um, that, that's just the worst news, if you will. And again, I hate to be Debbie Downer on that, but I think as investors, we all have to be thinking about, you know, from a portfolio allocation standpoint, what, that, what the implications of you know, 10 year returns are in terms of how we draw down when we're in retirement, how much we need to save when we're in the accumulation phase, and so forth. And I think it's an actually a really, really important point. Yeah, I mean, you know, it certainly feels as if the risk-free rate, the rate on fixed income assets in general, is going to be low from now out to the horizon and come up with any number of narratives why that should be. But I've learned over the years not to trust narratives, and I also can remember 35 years ago and 40 years ago when it seemed like we were going to be in an inflationary environment forever and it was never going to end. So, yeah, I think, you know, I think just to talk about that, yeah, I, 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 look, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and, you know, we all grew up in that inflationary period, and I, again, I remember, you know, that it was never going to change. I, I think a lot of what, you know, I talked about, I sounded pretty critical of central banks, and look, I get what they're doing the sense that the thing that they fear the most is deflation. Because as bad as inflation can be, deflation, once you get into a deflationary spiral, it, it is just the death of an economy.
And I think they've been obsessed with that. And when you look at the demographic factors uh, in particular, um, you can see why people are pushing against doing everything possible to prevent deflation from setting in broadly. And again, um, I'm not enough of a demographer, but as you sort of look at what the data suggests, um, there's going to be a lot of downward pressure um, because of, of the aging of the population and so forth globally. This is not a, a U.S. phenomenon, it is a global phenomenon. And I, I, I do think that you're right, Bill, that that could shape the narrative for a, a long time now. Thank you. Bill and Bill, thank you so much. For your